let's get started. Uh, welcome to a brand new week. I hope everyone had a nice weekend. Um, any questions on the, the lab or heaps or the graph stuff that we got into that I can answer to get us started? Yeah. So the graph, a tree is graph, but a, but not all graphs are trees. Is that? Uh, yes, that's that's a nice observation that we'll get into today. Like, what is the relationship between trees and and graphs? And we'll see uh, what types of graphs uh, actually count as trees. Uh, other questions. All right, let's jump into a quick uh, review, last bit of review on heaps. What is the purpose of the percolate up and percolate down heap operations? Uh, so movement towards C, that's great. Uh, these are the moving nodes up and down in our heap to make sure that uh, every node is uh, smaller than, than all of its descendants. Uh, any questions on this one? Brian. Um, so like, what would be the difference between uh, C and D? Uh, so D sorted order here is referring to the way that a binary search tree keeps everything like all things that are less are to the left, all things that are bigger are to the right. And so we have uh, a complete order of all of the, the nodes and just doing our, our in-order traversal, we can get them all out in order. That's not true of a heap. Heap's only keeping the, uh, basically the root at the minimum and then beyond that, things can be sort of um, in various orders. Uh, and so, I included D as an answer specifically to make sure we're thinking about a heap is not keeping everything in a total order, just this, like, just the minimum and then everything else. Does that make sense? Yeah. Other questions? All right, let's jump back into uh, graphs. So uh, we, uh, to remind you of where we were, our graph G could be represented by two sets, D and E. Uh, sets meaning uh, a set of unique or distinct items. Uh, so kind of every vertex will have a unique name. Every edge will be between two, uh, two particular vertexes. So our set of edges, we won't see the same edge multiple times. It's uh, a set that contains only unique uh, unique items. Um, and we said uh, these are vertexes or nodes. And here are edges. And uh, we had two kinds of edges. Does anyone remember what those, those two types of edges were? Yeah. I, mean, I don't remember the name, but one is direct on one way, and then the other one is two way. Yeah, we had the kind of two way undirected edge, and uh, we basically a graph will have either all undirected edges or. all directed edges. Um, and uh, our undirected edges, kind of it didn't matter which vertex we put first, it was the same edge. So here's some here's some other we Get these numbers. So here's some nodes. All right, 
so here's an undirected graph. And uh, we can talk about the uh, the degree of a vertex is the number of edges connected to that vertex. So for my undirected graph here, I would say this node 3, the degree of that node is 2, because there are two edges connected to it. Um, this node 1 would have a degree of 1. We could have a node off by itself that didn't have any edges connected to it that would then have degree 0. This actually splits into kind of two uh, uh, separate numbers when we're talking about a directed graph. We can have in degree and out degree, the number of edges that are coming into that node and the number of edges that are going out from that node. So to To use a directed example, our node here has in degree of 1, out degree of 1. Our node here has, uh, what is our, our in degree on this node? Yep, we have in is 2, and what is our out degree? Yep, also 2. Uh, so we just count degree kind of for in and out separately when we're dealing with a, a directed graph. Uh, two terms that apply equally to our directed and undirected graph is we can talk about the path from one node to another. So for example, if I wanted to show the path from 1 to 5, that would be here and then here. And so a path in general is a sequence of vertices. So a sequence of vertices connected by edges and importantly without repeating any edges. So our path from kind of 1 to 5 would be 1 to 5. And we will further say that a connected graph is one in which is one in which there exists there is a path to get between any two nodes so in this example here do we have a connected graph no we have kind of these two we have kind of these three separate pieces that uh, there's no edges that, that connect them. Any questions on these terms so far? It's making sense? Luke? If we were to have a path from um, one to three, would, would it just be multiple paths, or do you usually go by like shortest distance? Uh, there is one shortest path, but there are multiple paths. We have 1, 2, 5, 4, 3, 1, 2, 5, 3. In. If you have like a, um, 
like a directed one, and there's like um, like a vertex where it's like only going out and never coming in, would it not be connected then? Um, yes, yeah, so for our directed graph, um, yeah, so uh, a directed graph, let's see, does this have, this doesn't have any nodes like this. Um, but if I erased this edge from four to five, now we have no edge coming into five. So there, it is not the case that there is a path between any two nodes. Um, so th this graph would not meet that definition of, of connected. Jeffrey. You said that um, a, a path is a sequence of a vertices, but there's no repeats on the edges. Can the nodes or the vertices itself repeat if it gets looped back into it? Um, uh, I want to say no, that a path uh, is um, no repeats of, of vertices or edges. Other questions? So one kind of path that is going to often be relevant um, is a cycle. And a cycle is a path um, Where the first and last vertex are the same. So I guess to answer, to better answer Jeffrey's question, like could vertices repeat in a path? If they repeat, that is a cycle. So uh, is there a, uh, and one way we can think about a cycle is it's just a loop in the graph. So we would say there is a three, Three five four or three four five or five four three, uh, but these three vertices form a cycle. We're going to have a path that kind of starts and ends at the same place without repeating any edges. So, for example, six and seven would not form a cycle here because we couldn't start at six and end at six, having not repeated any edges. So, just like out and back on the same edge, that's not a path, and therefore not a cycle. Does that make sense? All right, do we have a cycle in our directed graph here? Uh, what, where, where is our cycle? Ron? One, two, three. Yeah, these three nodes here form our, form our loop, our cycle. Um, we can have just two nodes form a cycle in a directed graph. Uh, anyone see how that could happen? Liam? So there are two directed edges pointing to each node. Exactly. That we can start and end at the same node without repeating an edge because when we're dealing with the directed graph, our edges going in different directions are considered separate edges. So in this case, we'd also have this cycle here. Jake. Um, do undirected and directed edges have to be on like, different types of graphs, or can you have both in the same graph? Uh, I have never encountered a scenario where the two are mixed. It's you always have you either have a directed graph or an undirected graph. Um, you could turn a directed graph into an undirected graph by just saying every edge goes both ways. Then you essentially have um, your undirected graph. But yeah, they're you, they're not they don't get mixed. Other questions? Right. Okay. So, um,
last uh, some more uh, a few more terms here um, we have our uh, sets uh, V and E and some notation that's going to come up a lot is we'll want a way to uh, write down like an, ex an expression for the number of vertices or the number of edges that are in a graph. Uh, and uh, the mathematical notation is to put two bars on either side of a set, um, which the, the fancy word for it is the cardinality, cardinality of V, which just means the number of elements in the set. Uh, and so we can, we kind of say the, the, the size or the cardinality of the set V, that's our number of vertices. And we can have the same expression for edges, kind of the number of elements in our set of edges, the number of edges in the graph. Um, so, uh, there are some, some quantities I'd like you to consider, um, for Undirected and directed graph, uh, the minimum number of edges and the maximum number of edges. So take uh, two or three minutes, brainstorm with your neighbors what would be in each of these four uh, spots for the minimum and maximum edges. Uh, and um, for the maximum, uh, try and see if you can write it down in terms of the number of vertexes in the graph. Is there anything? The easy one. Uh, I do think that the graph I have drawn here, it has four nodes, no edges. That is a, a valid, if not very interesting, graph. So. Uh, indeed, minimum edge is zero. Uh, is that going to be the same or different for the directed case? Yeah, no reason that this couldn't be a directed graph. I mean, they're just there are no there are no edges. That's that's okay. Uh, the max edges is a is a little more interesting. So how about for um, for this undirected graph? How would I, I'm going to have a suggestion for how I'd go about like just drawing uh, a maximum number of edges here. Paul? Yeah, you can draw like a square around, and then like two diagonals. So like each vertex would go, or each edge would kind of go around the vertex, and so that you can draw one crisscrossing. Yeah, it seems like you're like, um, so we kind of draw these edges here, and how, like, how would you know that, like, are whether we're done or not, whether we've drawn all all the edges we can or not? Yeah. Well, in this case, each vertex has edges coming out from it, and also, like, there aren't any other vertexes, or, or there aren't any other edges to be drawn. At yeah, and sometimes we've connected every pair of vertexes. And so we have kind of every possible edge in an undirected graph of four nodes, we've put it in. So uh, if we were to think about this in terms of uh, the size of V, the number of vertexes, uh, anyone have 
a suggestion or a way that you're, you're thinking about how we might write down the maximum edges? Well, um, I don't know how to like say it. I, I mean, like the way I thought of it is like, um, like before, it's just all the numbers before four added together, like three plus two plus one, and then for five, it's four plus three plus two plus one. Yeah, that's that's a great way to think about it. That in like if we had no edges, I could go to a first node, and that has three edges coming out of it that that I can draw. Then I go to the next node, and there are sort of two edges coming out of that that are left to draw. Then I go to the next node, and there's one edge coming out of that left to draw, and then the last one, zero. So um, there's one wrinkle that I'll throw in here that I haven't mentioned. Uh, this doesn't make sense for all graphs, but some graphs also allow nodes to have edges to themselves. Um, you can uh, think about it like one of the examples that we talked about last time was that we... Um, made a graph of uh, there was a like Wikipedia page for Harding that linked to the the White House um, and maybe also the United States. Um, but you would also think that the web page about Harding might link to other places on that same page. Like there might be a table of contents on the Warren G. Harding page with links to like different subparts of that page. Uh, and so in that sense, in that case, it might make sense for this node to be like, oh, there are links to itself. Um, and so that the edge would represent something there. Uh, and so if we're in a graph that allows self edges, we can kind of put all of those in. Um, so we're either, kind of, we're maybe four, but definitely plus three, plus two, plus one. Um, Jake? Uh, I guess in that sense of like linking to itself for a Wikipedia article, for example, um, couldn't you link to multiple places so there would be multiple edges going or connecting the same nodes? Uh, yes, so in this graph, each node is an entire page. And so you're right. There might be many. There might be many links here, but our edges are a set, and so the edge from Harding to Harding is like we're only going to have like one instance of that in the edges, and like any one of them is sort of the same as the others from the perspective of just the graph structure. Um, so if we write down this sum of all our edges in terms of the, the number of vertices, we can see that it's uh, the number of vertices in, for the self edges plus the number of vertices minus one plus the number of vertices minus two all the way down to when we have just plus one. Um, and uh, we have uh, a kind of nice formula for this sort of sum. Um, anyone remember it off the top of your head? Uh, so factorial if we were multiplying these, um, but we're we're adding them up. Peter, it's n times n minus one over two. Yeah, we can we can see that we have we pair these two and get v plus one. We pair uh, v minus one and two and get v plus one. And we can form a kind of a bunch of these pairs of v plus one. Uh, so if we're allowing self edges, we have v plus one times size of v divided by two as our maximum edges. Uh, if we're if we're not allowing self edges, we just subtract one from each of these two things up here. Uh, if I were to put this in big O terms, what would I get? Is it, is it a O of, or is it, it's a pretty O of, like the cardinality? Uh, so this, when we're analyzing kind of uh, uh, algorithms on, on graphs, uh, we're going to often be thinking about kind of how many vertices are there, how many edges are there, and that's going to be in, in big O terms, so our sort of asymptotic analysis. It's going to be like big O of, yes. Uh, 
cardinality be like the exclamation point be uh, factorial? I think. Uh, we would have a factorial if it, we like kept multiplying this uh, by factors kind of all the way down to one, Charlie. Um, yeah, we like we have v plus one times v. That's v squared plus v all over two. We throw out all but the biggest terms, and we get big O of, of v squared. Does that make sense? All right, let's think about our directed uh, edges. Uh, anyone share how you were thinking about the maximum number of edges in a directed graph? Amadou? If we're not considering the edges that are on themselves, would it just be that times two? Since you can have like another one that comes that way. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's very close. Um, yeah, because if we, if we use our, our kind of do it by kind of starting with, with an empty, empty graph and drawing, like how many directed edges can I draw from this first node? Yeah, coming out of this first node, is, uh, we can have our R3. Uh, how about coming out of this node? Yeah, still, still three. And then this node still can put three in here. And this node also can draw three. And so, in this case, uh, and if I wanted to include the all the self edges, then I had uh, four for the first one, plus four for the next one, plus four for the next one, plus four for the next one. Uh, and if we put this in terms of v, we just get the size of v squared. Uh, if we get rid of the self edges, um, uh, um, and all of these become three, and we get v minus one squared, or size of v squared minus size of v. And whether we're allowing self edges or not, what is our kind of big O of our max edges in a directed graph going to be? Peter? Yes, we're still going to have cardinality of v squared as either v squared minus v or just v squared. Those are both going to be big O v squared. Any questions on any of these parts? All right, let's do a bit of quick practice. Here's a graph. Uh, there are no answers. Uh, right? So uh, someone uh, uh, share with us what is the size of V for this graph? Liam? Seven. Yeah, we, it's just the number of, of vertices, and we can count them up and, and find that it's, it's seven. Uh, I think next one, also missing answers. So uh, take a moment and, and think about what is the size of E for this graph. Ron? Um, seven. Yeah, we can again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, count up the edges. It's all good. Uh, all right, I have four properties here. Uh, connected, 
uh, a tree, uh, acyclic and directed. So any guesses? I haven't mentioned acyclic, but any guesses as to what that means? Charlie? Exactly. A cyclic equals no cycles. And uh, I will go through a kind of visual example in a moment. But in order to be a tree, we have acyclic undirected and connected. Uh, and you might think about kind of when we have kind of looked at trees, we've had nodes, we've had edges, uh, and the edges have not had a direction. Uh, we've never had nodes in a tree that are just off floating by themselves not part of the tree, so that's the connected piece, uh, and we've not had any sort of loops in our, in our tree, that's the acyclic piece. So now think about this graph pictured here, how many of these properties does it satisfy? Uh, I think the, the majority here has, has it correct. This graph is, uh, has none of these four, four properties. Um, see that there are kind of Two pieces, there aren't edges between. Um, any any questions on why none of these four properties apply to apply to this graph? All right, last one. How many distinct cycles does this graph have? And by distinct, I mean that in this graph, 3, 4, 5 would be the same cycle as 3, 5, 4. So just reordering the nodes within the cycle doesn't make them different cycles. So it's a need to involve uh, non-identical uh, non sets of, of vertices and edges to be distinct cycles. Uh, most people are, are thinking three. That's indeed correct. Uh, we have the square, we have the triangle, and then we have the house upside down with all five together. Aiden. So, like, if five and six would have been directed, so that would have been a cycle, right? Uh, if this were, were a directed graph and we had an edge from five to six and the edge from six back to five, yeah, yeah, that would have been this this kind of cycle. So, what's the difference? Because can't like you go both ways from that already? Yeah, the difference is we're not allowed to repeat edges uh, right. when we're talking about a path or a cycle. Uh, and in this case, 5 to 6 and back to 5 would use the same edge twice. And so would not, would not fit these particular definitions. Other questions? All right. Let's... Talk about Calvin Coolidge. So Coolidge uh, took over as president when Warren Harding died of a heart attack. This is toward the end of, of Harding's term, and Coolidge uh, uh, won, won re-election. Uh, this was a uh, period sometimes called the Roaring Twenties uh, in the U.S., lots of um, uh, economic growth, lots of speculation in the stock market, um, uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, there was um, fights about about uh, alcohol in society and a, and a prohibition movement to ban it. Um, Coolidge was a, a, a famously uh, famously a man of few words. Uh, there was a, a woman once came up to him and, and said, uh, "I bet that I could make you say more than two words." Uh, and Coolidge's reply was, "You lose." Uh, he also suffered some, some personal tragedy uh, in office. Um, uh, his, uh, his son was, I think, playing on a, on a tennis court and fell and, and, got and got a scrape. 
uh, and this grape became an infected, and his son actually died. Um, and uh, I've read uh, theories that, that Coolidge kind of suffered from, from uh, depression while in office, um, and that partially explains his kind of utter disinterest in doing things as president. Um, he both sort of philo philosophically and also just emotionally just like didn't want to get involved. Um, and uh, uh, he would often spend uh, uh, parts of his days with his kind of feet in an, uh, in an office drawer in the Oval Office, just watching traffic go by on the street outside. Um, kind of a weird sense of humor. He liked to like ring all the bells that would like call aides and service servants into the Oval Office and then hide behind the curtain and watch people kind of come in and be confused as to what was going on. Um, and uh, so kind of the, the federal government under Coolidge kind of didn't, uh, was not very active. Uh, the notable exception was Coolidge had an unusually um, uh, enterprising uh, and unusually influential uh, uh, Secretary of Commerce running the, the Department of Commerce, kind of experimenting with all sorts of things and different programs. Uh, this Commerce Secretary uh, was someone we'll, we'll be hearing about soon because the Secretary's name was Herbert Hoover. And so uh, we'll, we'll hear more about Mr. Hoover next time. Uh, I, I guess I, I'd also like to point out the 1924 presidential election. So this really uh, sectional uh, voting pattern in the U.S. where the uh, southern uh, states are, are solidly uh, democratic. Uh, the rest of the country, uh, uh, particularly the um, kind of northeast, is, is very Republican. And we can see the progressive party that, uh, that Theodore Roosevelt uh, ran on um, still, still around. Uh, Governor, former Governor La Follette of Wisconsin ran as the, the progressive um, Progressive Party candidate was was able to win Wisconsin. All right, so uh, make sure that we get through as much as we can. Go through a little bit faster. So uh, one kind of graph uh, that can be either directed or undirected is a weighted graph. Uh, and this is just the idea that our edges now have some numerical value associated with them. Uh, and uh, what's shown here is kind of different uh, cities you can take a ferry between in the Seattle Puget Sound area. Uh, and the weight on the edge might be the amount of time that that ferry ride takes. Uh, and there are lots of, of there are lots of kinds of graphs, pretty good if you think kind of uh, transportation, roads, or things like that, that are distance, or the amount of time, uh, or the cost of, of, of doing something. Uh, but then there are graphs like our, uh, uh, like our, our web page where maybe it's not clear if there should be weights or, or what they would be. And so we can, just like we have directed and undirected graphs, we have weighted and unweighted graphs, depending on whether there's these numbers associated with, with the edges. Does that make sense? All right, last uh, thing on this point is about trees. So I mentioned that uh, a tree, acyclic, undirected, and connected graph. So the one that I'm showing on the screen, this is a tree. It meets all the criteria of undirected, connected, and acyclic. Um, what's weird about this particular picture of a tree? Ben? It doesn't have like one. Yeah, there's not, there's, or it isn't drawn in a way with like the root at the top. Um, and so, in fact, we could take this graph. Uh, and we could kind of make it a, a rooted tree by saying, okay, A is going to be the root, um, and kind of redraw it with sort of A at the top and B and C as its children and so on. But we could just as easily say F is the root and redraw it with F at the top. 
So a lot of the, the tree structures that we've thought about, or all of them rather, are ones that have, have roots at the top and children, uh, children below them. Um, and when we're just thinking sort of pure kind of graph terminology, uh, there's nothing, uh, something can be a tree and, and not have a kind of specific root necessarily. All right, let's talk about something that we can do uh, with graphs. So I have here, this is, uh, it has not been updated for this year, um, but the CS department produces this chart of kind of paths through the CS major, different courses you can take, what the prerequisites are. So you can see 201 here, all these red arrows coming out of it are all the courses for which 201 is a prerequisite. Um, so what kind of graph is, like is this, uh, or I will claim that this is a graph, what kind of graph would it be? Charlie? Yeah, we have like, uh, these arrows are not two-way. 111 is a prerequisite for 201. 201 is not a prerequisite for 111. Right? These edges clearly just go in one direction. Um, is this uh, a weighted or unweighted graph? Emily? Weighted. Uh, wh what would the what what? would the weights be, or, or what makes you say weighted? I say unweighted. Unweighted, yeah. yes. Um, yeah, we don't, there's like, there's not different kind of uh, strengths or costs or levels or like some number that we would put on these edges. Something is a prerequisite, the edge is there, or it's not. Um, is this graph uh, cyclic or acyclic? Uh, uh, that's uh, yeah. It, it is. It is a cyclic. Um, would it be? Uh, what would it mean for there to be a cycle in this graph? Liam, we'd take the same course again. Yeah, you'd have like one course is course A is a prerequisite for course B is a prerequisite for course C, which is a prerequisite for course A. And so you just couldn't take any of those three courses without having taken all of them, um, which, you know, that would not be a great way to design a set of courses. Uh, so important that this sort of graph be acyclic, that it be directed, it's unweighted. Um, and there's a sort of, uh, and this combination of directed and acyclic uh, comes up very often. Uh, such that it often goes by the abbreviation DAG, a directed acyclic, acyclic graph. Um, one thing that we might do with this graph of, of course prerequisites is sort of look through it and figure out what order could one take these courses in following all the prerequisites. So sort of example output of that process, you might say, you can take 111, and then 202, uh, and then 201, and then 252, and 254, uh, 208, uh, 304, um, uh, uh, 257, uh, 231, uh, 251. I think that would get, uh, get all the... Uh, that, that would be a complete CS major um, as far as the courses on, on here go. Uh, is this the only possible way to complete the CS major? No. So this is a kind of a, a one of, of many possible sort of uh, ordering of the nodes in this graph. Um, And this output here uh, 
is a possible result of something called a topological sort on this directed acyclic graph. Uh, our topological sort of the our definition is we're going to output the vertexes of the graph such that no vertex is going to appear before No vertex is going to appear before another vertex that has an edge to it. And so what that means is that 201 cannot appear earlier in this output than 111, because 111 has an edge going into 201. This is a kind of useful thing when we're talking about, say, course prerequisites, because these edges uh, are basically a, like you have to take the course on the kind of start of the edge before you take the course on the end of the edge. Uh, and our topological sort kind of enforces that ordering uh, in, in the output. Does that make sense? What kind of, how this topological sort is kind of useful for these directed acyclic graphs in, in this sort of case. All right, so this graph is, is small enough that you can kind of look at it and figure out what a topological sort might be. But we might want to be able to have a computer perform this topological sort uh, on a much, much larger graph. So I don't want to have a way to sort of write down an algorithm for doing our topological sort. All right. So step one. I'm going to label each vertex in the graph with its in degree, with how many edges are coming into it. Um, we could uh, kind of think of this if each vertex was an object, it might have a field for the in degree of that vertex, and we just go through all of them and update that field to be, uh, to be this in degree. Or maybe you have some, some kind of separate array that's keeping track of this for, for, each, uh, for each vertex. And then our step two, So while we have vertices remaining that we have not yet output, we're going to choose some vertex V that has an n degree of zero. We're going to output V as the next uh, vertex in our topological sort. And we're going to uh, conceptually remove it from the graph, by which I mean mark V as we have already output this this node 
And then finally, for each of the neighbors of V, for each vertex U that is adjacent to this vertex V that we just, we just output, we will decrement the in-degree of u. So we'll kind of write down at each vertex which, um, what their in-degree is, uh, and then each time grab a vertex that has an in-degree of zero, output it in our sort, uh, and then kind of subtract one from the in-degree of all of its neighbors because we kind of dealt with that node uh, and, and uh, removed it from our graph. So I want to go through an example of uh, this topological sort uh, on our uh, uh, course graph. So start off with step one, write down the in-degree uh, of each node. Uh, and not surprisingly, the only CS course that has zero prerequisites, that has zero uh, edges coming into it, is 111. Uh, and the rest have between kind of one and, and three, according to, to, to our graph. Uh, and so then, uh, what would happen next in our, in our algorithm after we've kind of completed step one here? Serving? You can then like choose one of the, I guess uh, you can choose 201, 202, 208, and then remove its like end of so it could be zero. Uh, I think we're, we're jumping ahead just a bit. We have to choose the vertex with in degree zero. Um, so we couldn't start with, basically we can't start with a course until we've already output its prerequisites. Um, yeah, so we would we would start with 111. Uh, our output so far would be 111, uh, and then uh, which uh, uh, and then yes, then we would kind of go through the nodes that 111 connects to and subtract one from all of their their in degree. So we have removed 111, uh, and 111 is a prerequisite for. 201, 202, 208, we subtract one from the in-degree of those, of those nodes. That makes sense? Then we just repeat because we have kind of, we haven't output all the rest of these, and now we can just choose any of the three that have current in-degree zero, kind of any of the three for which we have satisfied the prerequisite. Um, uh, this graph is out of date because since it was made, 201 has become a prere prerequisite for 208. Um, but as of the 2021 20, uh, year, uh, one of them was the only prerequisite. So we might just choose 202 next, uh, mark it as, as removed, and we subtracted one from the in degree of 252 and 254, which are, uh, we can see, those are two. Those are two that, that two or two leads to. It also goes to three twenty and two thirty one. Um, which was n so three twenty should have gone down to one. That is, oh yeah, here we go. That has gone down to one here, uh, and, and two thirty one has gone from three to two. Uh, and so we would just continue uh, choosing another. Zero in degree, maybe 208. Uh, subtract one from the only course it leads to, 231, uh, so on and, and so forth. And once we have kind of uh, uh, processed uh, our first four nodes here, kind of all the others have, remaining nodes have in degree zero, and we would kind of go through them in, in whatever order. Does that make sense? All right, so 
we have an algorithm. Uh, one thing to notice is that we need a vertex of degree zero to start with. Like this only works if there is at least one node that starts with an in degree of zero. Um, that's why this only applies to directed acyclic graphs. Because if we have a cycle, then it isn't necessarily the case that there is a node with an in degree of zero. But if we don't have any cycles, we, we can be sure that there's at least one node that doesn't have an edge coming into it. Um, so uh, let's look at some pseudocode for uh, this algorithm. Uh, step one is we were labeling each vertex with its degree. Uh, and then for some counter, counting up to the number of vertices, find the zero degree vertex put it in our output, and then go through its neighbors and subtract uh, one from their in degree. So I'd like you to work with your neighbors on coming up with a big O efficiency of this topological sort. Um, because we have a graph, our input, the size of our input isn't n. It's described in the number of vertices and the number of edges. So instead of kind of one uh, input into our big O, we have size of D and size of E. So uh, yeah, take three, four minutes, just kind of try and get started brainstorming on, on how you would analyze this algorithm. All right, and we're almost out of time. So I just want to, uh, we'll have more time to, to talk about this on Wednesday, but just to go through the initialization, this label each vertex with its degrees. We have to go through each vertex, and then along with each vertex, we have to count up all the edges connected to that vertex. Uh, so we can think of this as we have to go through all the vertexes and then also all the edges. So size of V plus size of E, kind of do a go through all the vertices to label them with the degree, and then define the degree we're kind of counting each edge uh, once across this whole process. Or find new vertex. Here where it's assuming uh, uh, we don't know exactly what this what this does, but sort of the simple thing, just search, look, loop through all the vertices uh, to find one with degree zero. Uh, that might be that would be size of V to kind of loop through all of them. Uh, and we're doing this once for each vertex that we're outputting. Um, so we can say this kind of the sum of all the, like if we add up kind of all V uh, loops of this, of this outer for loop, if we're doing kind of this for loop V times and each of these operations takes iterating through all the vertexes, then we'll end up with big O of, of V squared. Um, and then this inner for loop, there's sort of a, a tricky way to think about it, which is we're going through the nodes adjacent to V, and nodes are adjacent because there's an edge between them. And once we have gone through an edge in this loop, We've subtracted one from the interview. We're not going to go through that edge again. Uh, and so this inner for loop, if we add up kind of all the separate times that it runs, it will have gone through each edge in our graph once to kind of subtract one from the in degree of some node. And so all the decrements together, big O size of E, and if we kind of total all these up, that's big O size of V squared, because we know that the maximum edges is V squared. Big O of V squared, so kind of big O of V squared plus big O of V squared plus big O of V squared, because it's total of big O of V squared. Uh, we might wonder, is this good? Is this bad? Come on Wednesday to find out. <laughs>
I have office hours starting uh, shortly. Um, lab due uh, on Wednesday night, and I'll see you then. Okay. <laughs>